Good morning uh, to some and good afternoon to others. And we'd like to welcome and thank you for attending our day two, session two of our pharmaceutical sterility assurance, contamination control, and extractables and leachables webinar series. This webinar session of bacterial endotoxin testing, history, inhibition, enhancement, and process control is aimed at providing pharmaceutical companies uh, an oppor the opportunity to establish and or refresh their fundamental testing knowledge, gain, uh, achieve more efficient testing outcomes, and, effect and an effective and accurate testing outcomes. Here to present is Dan Lovero, one of our resident experts at Nelson Laboratories, Fairfield. Just a couple of housekeeping items like to take care of. Uh, if you've missed one of our webinars, or if you simply would like to refer back to this one or any of our other webinars, you can always find them on demand on the Nelson Labs website on the On Demand webinars page listed under Education, under the Under Education tab, and you'll find this about a week after uh, the event. Also, I'd like to inform everyone: we hope that we are able to conduct in May 2021 a live pharmaceutical three-day seminar series with our sister company, Sterigenics. You can find more information on this event on the nelsonlabs.com website under events. Um, you can receive notifications of these types of events as well as information regarding testing, sterilization, or other industry news by follow, following us on Twitter, LinkedIn, or liking us on Facebook. After this webinar, we welcome all of your questions, and you can submit them at any time. You will use the questions uh, button on your console to submit these questions. Uh, and we will try to answer, or Dan will try to answer as many questions in the last 15 minutes as we possibly can. So let me introduce you to Dan. Dan has been with Nelson Labs Fairfield since October of 2013. He started in the molecular biology department performing cleaning validations on reusable medical devices and the associated biological marker assays. Within a few months, he was moved to the BET department of which he currently is the manager. In addition to BET, he currently oversees particulate matter method one and two, water activity, environmental, environmental monitoring, and the bio burden testing. Not one to shy away from the opportunity, Dan has also has his hand uh, in the management of many other departments, including shipping, receiving, and procurement. And just on a side note, Dan also can be found in the theater on the weekends performing. So, well, welcome, Dan, and the time is now yours. Thanks so much, Mike, and I would like to say that uh, you can't find me in the theater anymore because of the pandemic, but I'm hoping that changes soon. So welcome everybody. Today we're going to be going over bacterial endotoxin testing and with that we'll be going over the history, inhibition enhancement, and process control. So we're going to start off with the history of the test of both endotoxins as well as the development of the methods used to test for them. To start off, uh, pyrogen is any substance that can induce fever. It comes from the words pyro, meaning fire, and gen, meaning creation. Uh, there are different types of pyrogens found in different places. In the healthcare industry, the most prevalent source are bacterial endotoxins. Endotoxins are different from exotoxins. Exotoxins are purposefully released into the external environment, whereas endotoxins are contained within the bacteria and shed as part of metabolism or cell death. Uh, recent work has shown that endotoxins can be released during metabolic processes such as vessel trafficking. Since endotoxin makes up the vast majority of pyrogens in healthcare, a test for endotoxin alone can be used to label a product as non-pyrogenic. Pyrogens are active even if their source is not, so if a bacteria is releasing a pyrogen, even if you kill that bacteria and not the pyrogen, it'll still be active. Um, so any blood or cerebral spinal contacting parenterol, a parenterol being a product administered in any root other than the mouth or alimentary cavity, risks inducing a pyrogenic response in a patient. 
the alimentary cavity being the path from mouth to anus. In the context of the micro lab, when we talk about endotoxin, we're referring specifically to this molecule, a lipopolysaccharide, which is abbreviated as LPS. LPS is a component of the outer cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, and as I said before, released during metabolism. Pyrogens and endotoxin can cause fever, meningitis, swelling, um, and a rapid fall in blood pressure if introduced into blood or tissues of the body, and it can happen very rapidly. And endotoxin can cause this fever reaction even if the bacterial cells have been inactivated. Therefore, products that show low or no bioburden can, in fact, contain endotoxin. Endotoxin is extremely stable and can be found wherever bacteria can be found. Uh, it's very difficult to prevent. It can be found everywhere, um, and it's very small. It's only a molecule, so it can pass through conventional sterilizing filters. A traditional sterilization method, moist heat, ethylene oxide, or radiation will not significantly destabilize endotoxin. The only real way to get rid of it would be um, inactivation through deparogenation. Uh, really, any process that removes endotoxin can be called deparogenation, but when we talk about that in the micro lab, we specifically mean dry heat. Uh, the temperature required to effectively destabilize endotoxin is 250 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. Lower temperatures for longer durations are not effective. This is difficult to do depending on your product. For instance, if your product is made of plastics or other sorts of uh, substances like that, they melt if you put them in the oven like this. So uh, other methods such as distillation, reverse osmosis, ultrafiltration sometimes have to be considered as well. So testing for pyrogens began with the rabbit pyrogen test. The rabbit pyrogen test, the concept of this test is that you inject whatever substance it is that you are testing into a rabbit. And if that rabbit develops a fever, it can be considered to be pyrogenic. It was important to test for these products because prior to World War II, uh, there was a really big need for intravenous liquids, things like that, um, that were causing reactions. So the origins of the LAL test, which is what we're mainly going to be focusing on today, were the 1950s and the 1960s. A man by the name of Frederick Bang observed horseshoe crab blood coagulation when injected with seawater and cultures of gram-negative rods. He also observed that clotting did not occur when injected with gram-positive bacteria. He partnered with the man by the name of Jack Levin, and they identified that it was the amoebocytes specifically and not the blood that attributed to the clotting. And they did this in the Atlantic horseshoe crab, Limulus polysimus. So the Limulus test, the Limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL, which is uh, abbreviation you'll often see, was introduced in 1971 as a potential replacement for the rapid pyrogen test. And very shortly, we're going to be going into the pros and cons of both tests. This test was really put to the test in 1973. Um, Baxter had a batch of dialysis solution that was inducing sporadic pyrogenic responses, even though the batch had passed quality control testing. They used the LAL test because they could not get a hold on enough rabbits to perform the testing they wanted to test. And they found that one of their four filling stations was contaminated with gram negatives and introducing endotoxin. And this lined up pretty um, accurately to the fact that about one out of every four bottles was showing this reaction. Baxter ended up reporting this result to the FDA in the US. And they also saw that there were no false negatives, but they were detecting endotoxin in substances that were not inducing pyrogenic responses in rabbits. That's very critical. In 1987, the FDA issued guidelines to help the commercial change from the rabbit pyrogen test to LAL. They introduced guidance for validation of techniques and switching to the new technique. They also included endotoxin limits, how much endotoxin was allowable in a product and the FDA allowed non-pyrogenic labeling if the endotoxin limit was not met. The push for the endotoxin test really was that it had a greater sensitivity. It could detect much, much less endotoxin, and also it was highly specific towards endotoxin, very accurate, 
and a lot cheaper and a lot more rapid. The LAL test became the official replacement for the majority of parenteral testing in 1993 in the United States. It had guidance for the photometric techniques, which we are going to be talking about, and that guidance became official in 2001. So here I've highlighted the main differences between the two methods, um, namely the model they're performed in, what they're capable of detecting, and the quality of the results. So looking at the rabbit pyrogen test, rabbits have a similar endotoxin tolerance to humans. That's why they were chosen. And as I said, the sample is injected into the rabbit, and if it develops fever, it's considered a positive result. It's not specific. It detects all pyrogens because anything that causes a fever is going to be detected. It's costly. It takes a long time. Um, it harms animals since you're injecting this into rabbits, and ad, uh, advocates were not happy with it. And you also can't quantify the results. It's either a fever or it's not. So the limulus amoebocyte test is specific to endotoxin and uses this clotting action found in horseshoe crab blood. It's an extract from amoebocytes, which are equivalent in function to white blood cells in humans. They're mobile cells that seek out and attack foreign bodies. Um, and it's highly sensitive to bacterial endotoxin. It's significantly cheaper, very rapid. Um, the standard test takes 60 minutes. The photometric techniques can be done in less time. It does not directly harm animals. Horseshoe crabs are bled and then released back into the wild. And you can quantify results. This method of bleeding horseshoe crabs does have a low mortality while it's being performed, but there's evidence to suggest that the mortality rates are higher than currently accepted. Uh, once the animals are released back into the wild, it's hard to keep track of if they live or die. And bleeding crabs and taking their nutrients from them through their blood could possibly be leading to a lack of reproductive behavior later on, which can indirectly impact the population. I put a note on the bottom here too. So the um, Tachypleus is another genus of horseshoe crab. It's found in Southeast Asia and its blood has a, the exact same reaction. So sometimes that's used instead of limulus. And if you see a TAL, which is Tachypleus amoebocyte lysate, then that's what that is. The method is equivalent and accepted for use. So here I have the mechanism of the LAL reaction. On the top left of that picture, you can see the endotoxin, LPS. So it's a very simple enzymatic cascade. LPS activates factor C, which is an enzyme. Activated factor C activates factor B. Activated factor B activates the pro-clotting enzyme, which leads to a clotting enzyme, which ends up activating the substrate into coagulin. Coagulin is what causes the clotting activity. You'll see on the bottom too, it says or chromogenic peptide. So with the photometric techniques, a chromogenic peptide is actually added to the reagent by the manufacturer and cleaved upon activation of the LAL cascade. So that clotting enzyme recognizes and cleaves that chromogenic substrate that causes coloration of the reaction mixture, and then that change in coloration can be read by a microplate reader. The substrate that's added is colorless, and the actually the chromophore is paranitroanalyzed. When the substrate is recognized and cleaved, the resultant chromophore is yellow and absorbs light at 405 uh, nanometers. You'll see in the hashed box that it contains a substance known as 1 to 3 beta D glucan, which is usually just referred to as glucan, and I'll be referring to it just as glucan. Glucan is known as an LAL reactive material. In 1981, reports of this substance started surfacing and actually did lead to false positives in varied products. This product was identified as beta-D-glucan, a non-pyrogenic polysaccharide found in yeast cell walls and cellulosic materials. So this alternative pathway can be blocked by the use of an en uh, a endotoxin specific buffer sometimes known as a glucan blocker so basically this substance comes in at a different point in the cascade skips over factor c factor b 
um, and can actually enhance the reaction. Common sources of glucan in manufacturing are yeast fermentation and cellulosic filters. I want to go back real quick. It's important to note uh, that endotoxin is not directly measured. So what's actually measured is that clotting at the end or the development of color. So when you get results for an endotoxin test, you're not going to be told how much toxin there is. Rather, you're going to be told how reactive the test was. Uh, this reactivity is reported in endotoxin units, EU, in the USP and some of the other compendia. Some of the compendia use international units, IU, and those two units have been standardized. So one EU equals one IU. It should really be appreciated how sensitive this test is. One EU is equivalent to approximately 0 0.1 nanograms of E. coli endotoxin, which is 0 0.1 parts per billion. The most sensitive test that we have right now down to 0 0.001 endotoxin units per milliliter is capable of detecting 0 0.1 picograms per milliliter, which is one part per trillion or one trillionth of a gram. So we've briefly covered the history and the importance of testing for endotoxin. Um, and now we're going to go over some of the more practical and technical aspects, use of the LAL test as a quality control tool in the commercial pharmaceutical industry. So you'll see this phrase inhibition enhancement a lot. Interference of this test manifests as either inhibition or enhancement because the LAL test is biological in nature. So the types of things that interfere with the test are things that are also biological, pH, um, salts, enzymatic activity, chelators, detergents. The acceptable degree of inhibition or enhancement of the reaction is 0 0.5 to two times or 50 to 200%. And you'll be seeing that a little bit later as well. So if we encounter interference of the test, we need to overcome it in order to deliver a valid result. So just like any other microbial test, if you were testing for um, E. coli bacteria, you would need to make sure that whatever media you're using can grow that E. coli when challenged with it. So that's really what this is. It's making sure the test is capable of detecting what we think it's detecting so that we don't report false positives or false negatives. Dilution of the sample is the most common and best approach to overcoming interference as it doesn't alter the product other than making it more dilute. Uh, the result obtained is then multiplied by the dilution to get the result. It's important to know that as you dilute samples, yes, you dilute out these interfering factors, but you also risk diluting out in, uh, measurable endotoxin. So you can't perform a dilution that's too high as to not be able to detect what may be there. You can also adjust the pH with acid or base. The optimal range of the reaction is physiological, six to eight. An endotoxin-specific uh, buffer can be used if glucan is suspected. And of course, heat inactivation. There's a key concept in testing for inhibition and enhancement. The sample itself is tested, but then you also have a sample of the sample that is spiked with a known endotoxin concentration. You then compare the unspiked and the spiked samples, expecting to see what you spiked. If you have less than what you spiked, your reaction has been inhibited. If you have more than what you spiked, it's been enhanced. This spike is known as the positive product control, which is abbreviated as the PPC. This is very important. This is so we make sure that in inhibition, false negatives are not being reported, or enhancement, false positives are not being reported. False negatives are worse than false positives as they open up the possibility of releasing potentially pyrogenic substances. CSE, control standard endotoxin, is what we use to perform the spikes as well as prepare the standards. They've been calibrated against a reference standard. Reference standards are very expensive and not so widely available. And since CSE has been um, confirmed for use in testing, that's what the laboratory will use. The CSE preparation is very similar across assays as the reagent that determines the reaction kinetics is the lysate. The sensitivity of the lysate is designated as the Greek letter lambda. 
typical values for lambda are between 0 0.001 and 0 0.03. When you are submitting a sample to a laboratory, you sh it's important to know how sensitive of a test you actually want performed. The more sensitive lysates are obviously more expensive. And here we have a comparison between the two types of LAL testing. As I mentioned before, we have the traditional method of the LAL test, gel clot. That uses the clotting cascade of the LAL pathway. The test itself is very straightforward. There are different sensitivities in manufacturers. Results are qualitative, which is really important. The sample either clots or it doesn't. It's either pass or fail. So if you are looking for a quantified result, you will not get it with the gel clot test. The measurement that is made by the technician performing this either formation of a clot or absence of a clot, as I mentioned, after the control series and samples with PPCs are prepared, the lysate is added and the reaction is allowed to run. Tubes are then removed and carefully inverted. The gel clot is the go-to test when the sample would be inappropriate for testing in the kinetic test based on the coloration. Remember that the kinetic test is using a color change in the product. So if the product is deeply colored, the machine won't be able to read it. So drug products containing dark substances such as iron, uh, suspensions, dyes, things like that may not be appropriate for the gel clot test. Positive product controls are run that bracket the label claim, the sensitivity lambda. So the sample endpoint where the clotting stops must be between 0.5 to 2 lambda. By preparing different concentrations of CSE, the inhibition enhancement properties of the sample can be challenged. If the reaction mixture clots below 0.5 lambda, that means that the sample has enhanced the reaction to an inappropriate amount, since it should not be sensitive to endotoxin at that low of a dilution. If the sample does not clot at 2 lambda, that means that the reaction has been inhibited. So you're, what you're doing with 2 lambda is you're putting in double the amount of the sensitivity. So if your sensitivity is 0.03 EU, that 2 lambda is actually containing 0.06, which is that top limit, that 200%. If that does not clot, then your reaction has been inhibited. Either way, the technician must assess what may be causing the interference and perform appropriate next steps. The kinetic method is a newer method, but that does not necessarily mean it's better. It's just different. There are two main methods to the kinetic method, a chromogenic method, which uses the chromophore that I explained earlier, and a turbidimetric, which actually does allow the clotting to reaction, and it me measures the change in optics of that reaction. Results are quantitative, which is very important because you're using a microplate reader that is able to uh, generate standard curves and plot unknowns, you can actually get a definitive number, which may be of interest to you depending on the needs of your sample. So once this standard curve has been prepared, what you do is take the control standard and the toxin, prepare known concentrations of it, and then you put that in the machine and tell the machine what those are. And then it takes those, your samples, the unknowns, and extrapolates them onto the standard curve. The PPC is also performed. That's the sample that has been spiked with the known amount of endotoxin. The percent recovery, so when the machine compares the amount of endotoxin in the sample and the amount of endotoxin in the spiked sample, that must be between 50 to 200%. If it's less than 50, the reaction has been inhibited, and if it's greater than 200, it has been enhanced. So those are the two main methods of LAL testing. And now what we're gonna spend some time on is actually going through what that process looks like in the lab. And if you were a prospective uh, customer of Nelson Labs, what you may expect um, when submitting a sample for endotoxin testing. So the first thing you'll need to do is set up a testing plan. When requesting that endotoxin is to be performed, it will be important to describe your sample in detail. It may be something simple, such as sodium chloride, 
or maybe something advanced, such as a proprietary drug formulation or medical device. And then based on what you tell the lab, they may suggest which test to perform. At Nelson Labs, we perform all types of LAL testing, but not every type is done at every location. So determining what you need up front will help us connect you to whoever you may need to be connected to. The specification. So if you remember earlier, the FDA had released limits to endotoxin uh, in certain products. It's very important to know when you're testing for endotoxin, what is the maximum allowable amount? Um, that is gonna drive a lot of the testing decisions, which method to perform, how far to dilute it, to use any sorts of buffers or anything like that because this determines the maximum valid dilution. And we're gonna get into some of these calculations in just a little bit. The sampling size is a question I get a lot when I'm working with customers is how many samples do I test? So there are a few recommendations about this. Um, the recommendation we usually go from is the ANSI Amy SC72, which suggests between three to 10 devices, depending on your batch size or if you have a risk-based approach that you've performed at your location, we can go with that. So once we know the specification, the method to be performed and the sampling size, we'll have to decide how we wanna prepare the sample. Drug products very simply are usually diluted or treated. Um, medical devices are extracted with endotoxin-free water. So if they can be extracted whole, we'll put them in a jar with water. Um, and if they need to be cut up, we can do that too. Water is really the only substance that isn't inhibitory or enhancing to the LAL reaction. Um, so that is what is used as the standard for performing all standard dilutions and extractions and sample dilutions. Sometimes our sponsors know the specification. Other times they want us to calculate it. Um, and you know that would be something that would be determined when you were submitting. Again, this anti Amy ST72, this outlines recommended criteria for setting up validation or routine sample preparation. Uh, it leaves the specifics of how to perform the test up to the compendia. The recommendation is to perform inhibition enhancement on three unique lots. This accounts for lot to lot variation as well as variation within the test. If you have a product that has a coating on it, um, depending on your manufacturing process, more or less coating could be on different lots. And if that coating is interfering with the test, you would wanna be able to capture that and make sure that whatever method you're moving forward with will be a reliable one. The last thing I have on this slide is about pooling of samples. So pooling of samples is allowable and the FDA has released some guidelines regarding it. When we pool drug samples, typically three, to represent the beginning, the middle, the end of your production. The MVD must be adjusted to account for this, but we're gonna be looking into that in a little bit. The endotoxin specification is really important. I've included this table here to show you what sorts of information and thought needs to go into it, um, but we're not gonna get too technical here because the USP and other major compendia actually have assigned specifications for a lot of common products. And remember that the specification is the maximum allowable endotoxin. So products can be released if they contain endotoxin as long as it's not above the limit that has been designated for them. And again, it's expressed in EU in the USP, IU in some of the other compendia. It is dose dependent meaning that two dosages of the same product will have different specifications. And if you're looking in a monograph or a compendia for a specification, it's very important to make sure you're looking at the most current version. Um, it can easily change. And if you are looking at an old version of a document, that can be missed. So the way if we are going to calculate a specification, we would do that is using the equation K over M, where K equals the threshold pyrogenic dose and M equals the dose per kilogram per hour. I haven't included this math because this is really something you would only need to do on a you know, case by case basis. 
because the specifications for a lot of products are already assigned. And that includes parenteral devices and intrathecal devices, intrathecal being uh, spinal column contacting. So those are already assigned. So again, I put this table in here um, so that you can see all sorts of things. We don't test a lot of radio pharmaceuticals and things like that. Um, some of those more intense samples usually have to be tested in an alternate method. It could be the rabbit pyrogen test. There are a few other endotoxin testing methods um, that are a little bit newer than the LAL, but the LAL is the most widely performed method. So I've brought this here, the calculation of maximum valid dilution, because this is something that is done with every single sample that comes in. The MVD is calculated for drug products as the specification times the concentration over the sensitivity. And I've given some examples here. So if you look at drug product A with a concentration of five milligrams per ml and a specification of no more than 15 endotoxin units per ml, and the test sensitivity of 0.005 EU per ml, if you were to plug those numbers into the above calculation, you would come out with 3000, which means if you're testing drug A, in order to do a valid test, you cannot dilute it any farther than one to 3000. When the specification is expressed in a unit of measurement other than EU per ml, that would be per milligram, per gram, then the concentration is factored in, but it's not always of relevance. In the gel clot test, a negative result will be reported as less than the sensitivity. So if your reagents are sensitive down to 0.03 EU per milliliter, and you do not get a clot, you can report that as less than 0.03 EU per milliliter. But then if you've already diluted the sample, you'll have to account for it. So if you've performed a one to 10 dilution on your sample and you run the reaction and you get a result of less than 0.03 EU per ml, you have to remember that your product is at one tenth the strength. So any endotoxin that is in it would have been decreased tenfold. So by multiplying it back by 10, you would actually report less than 0.3 EU per milliliter. And this is the same for kinetic. Looking at that calculation, the maximum valid dilution will increase with increased sensitivity because you have a smaller number on the bottom. Increased specification or increased concentration of the product, it will decrease with a tighter specification, a decreased sensitivity, or a decreased concentration. On the bottom, you'll see some examples of medical devices. The MBD is the same concept, although it's calculated a little bit differently. Instead of having a, a concentration, you usually have an extraction volume. When you perform an extraction on a medical device, you're taking any endogenous endotoxin and dispersing it through that extraction. So the amount of water you use to do that is very important. So the MVD will decrease with higher extraction volumes, which makes sense because again, the more you dilute out the endotoxin, the less you can dilute it in the end. And tighter specifications will also uh, decrease the MVD. So I've shown some calculations there. I've highlighted this because it's so important when performing endotoxin testing, because when you get a non-detectable result, meaning in the gel clot test, it has not clotted, or in the kinetic test, if the reaction does not occur within your standard curve, which is very common, you'll be reporting a less than value. If your specification is 20 endotoxin units per device and the result you get back from the lab is less than 30, it could be in specification that could be less than 20, but it could also be 21, 22, 30. It could be out of specification, so it's an ambiguous result. So this is very, very important and has to be done before the testing can be done. Here I have some uh, descriptions of sampling sizes and sample preparation. As I mentioned before, the recommendation is between three and 10, no more than 10 
this does have for batch sizes less than 30 number of samples two. However, this is not really recommended anymore. It really is recommended to perform between three and 10. If you're in doubt, go with 10. You can never do too much testing in that regard. As I covered before, dilution of the drug product will most often simply be dilution with water for sample preparation. The technician will test the pH of the reaction mixture, the lysate plus the sample to make sure it falls within the optimum range. Endotoxin reagents are self-buffering, so it's very important that you test the pH of the mixture, which I have forgotten to do before and gotten very frustrated that I could not get my pH within range, only to realize I was testing a base without additional lysate. Further dilution can be performed if it's not within range, assuming that that wouldn't bring you over your maximum valid dilution. Other options can be explored, such as pH correction. You can also use organic solvents, such as ethanol, methanol, if the sample's not initially water-soluble, although these solvents are inhibitory to the test, so you'll want to make sure to dilute those out later. Medical devices, again, can be tested whole or disassembled. They're extracted with endotoxin-free water. All the water that's used to test must be tested itself. And which has been preheated to 37 degrees Celsius for no less than 60 minutes. And after that, dilution of the extract may be required. Here I've given an example of two gel clot validations. I focused on the samples and not included the control data. I've granted this example a valid control series. Lambda for this example is 0 0.03 EU per ml, meaning that clotting will only be observed if the reaction mixture contains greater than that number. I've included two samples, the first being an intraortic balloon catheter and the other being a spinal catheter. I set the specifications at the industry standard. I tested them both undiluted, and this is totally made up, by the way. I've given them different extraction volumes. The USP requires that the sample and PPC reactions be performed in quadruplicate. That's why you see four results under the PPC result. Zero is no clot plus this clot observed. The first point of interest is the PPC results for the first device. That clotting was observed in all PPC results. The gelation endpoint needs to be between 0 0.5 and 2 lambda. The fact that that 0 0.25 lambda clotted, which is below the sensitivity of the test, remember the sensitivity is 0 0.03. And um, that would be lambda, so a quarter lambda would be that number over four. Um, because it clotted there, that means that the reaction is being enhanced. The gel clot test cannot tell the difference between enhancement and endogenous endotoxin. And endotoxin in the sample or enhancement of the reaction by the sample will produce the same result. That is one of the drawbacks to gel clot testing and kinetic testing can tell the difference. So at this point, we would repeat this study with a higher dilution, assuming that we could. If this was at the maximum valid dilution, then we would have to discuss further steps. For the second sample, the endpoint of gelation is exactly at lambda, which is within that range. So the undiluted extract is therefore a valid dilution to perform moving forward for routine. I haven't shown any inhibition here, but inhibition would look like from a quarter lambda to two lambda, all zeros. The sample would have to be diluted further or treated to overcome the inhibition. Here are two examples for kinetic. I've used the same samples. I have not included the control data. When performing a standard curve, uh, you basically perform a serial dilution set of standard. A typical curve would look something like 5 EU, 0 0.5 EU, 0 0.05 EU, and then maybe even down to 0 0.005. The concentration you spike your standards to is about the middle point of the curve. If you have a three-point curve, you would do the, sec the middle one. And if you have a four-point curve, you could choose one of those to do. Multiple dilutions are very typical of a kinetic validation. Remember with the gel clot, we just had undiluted. Here we have for the first one, undiluted one to two, one to four, and the other one we have one to eight, 16, and 32. 
more information can be gathered doing it this way because the kinetic test can distinguish between endotoxin and enhancement. Two-fold dilutions are commonly employed. That 50 to 200 percent variability means that that's the resolution of the test is two. So if you perform dilutions that are less than one to two, such as um, one to two and one to 2.5, you're not going to get very much more information because those ranges overlap. So when we perform schemes like this, we always do one to twos. We only have to perform it in duplicate and we get a reaction time, how long it took that reaction to onset. There's a predetermined optical density change and those values are averaged together and that's what you see in the sample result. That's the raw result of the reaction. Wherever a dilution was performed, that must be factored in. If the sample was tested at one to four, then it has to be multiplied by four. If it was extracted with liquid, that has to be factored in two. You'll see that in the EU per device. The sensitivity of the test, which is the lowest standard on the curve, that's the detection limit times the dilution times the volume. Looking at the first sample, all of those PPC recoveries are within range, 50 to 200 percent. The EU per device come, came out to 17, 16, around that area, uh, which fits that 20 EU specification. So that sample is within spec, and also this method is valid. So we would pick a dilution to perform for routine moving forward. Typically, it's whichever one is closest to 100 percent, although not always. There are other things that get factored in. Um, but that's a little bit out of the scope right now. On the second sample, you'll notice that first one I've marked as OOS, out of specification. It is above the 2.4 specification. The 2.4 is above the 2.15. But you'll also notice that the PPC recovery came out to 216%, which is out of range. That means that this reaction has been slightly enhanced. You'll see as the sample was diluted on that that recovery went down to almost 100%. So that, that sample is actually within specification because the routine dilution that be performed would not be one to eight. I also want to bring your attention to that less than 3.2 all the way on the bottom. That is what I was talking about before. That sample has been tested outside of its maximum valid dilution, which means that somebody didn't do their math correctly. So reporting a less than 3.2 result, which is technically true, um, does not give you the information you need, mainly is it less than 2.15. The last slide I have here is troubleshooting. Um, I spend a lot of time with customers when we don't have results that are quite making sense into why that may be. Um, one of the first places we look, depending on what the results look like, is glucan contamination. Again, cellulose-based filters, yeast fermentation, things like that. It's not usually performed unless it is suspected. It would be suspected if one of those things was in your pro uh, process, or if a sample that has routinely shown low results is suddenly showing an upward trend. Glucan works synergistically with endotoxin, meaning that it can greatly enhance the recovery of spiked endotoxin. This is usually observed as very high endotoxin results coupled with very high recovery. Endotoxin reagents are standardized towards endotoxin reactivity, not glucan reactivity. So different lots of reagent and reagents between manufacturers can respond very differently to glucan. So if we're seeing inconsistent results um, between lots, that can definitely be a reason. Um, other things, if you remember that Baxter example from 1973, um, different fill lines, different technicians performing the fill, things like that. If a sample is being transported halfway through production, those are all things to look at. So potential solutions would be obviously use of an endotoxin blocking buffer. Uh, it's very easy to immediately suspect and blame glucan. Um, that's usually the first thing people want to jump to, but it is important to properly investigate and identify if it's indeed the source. And if it is, trying to eliminate it replacing filters that may be old and shedding material, uh, sourcing reagents alternatively. If you're using something that comes from yeast, see if you can get it somewhere else. And you can also test samples from in-process. 
um, if there's five or six key points in your process, maybe sending a sample from each of those can help you identify where endotoxin and or glucan is being introduced. Um, if you have a product kit, a syringe with a needle and all sorts of things, testing those things individually may yield um, a very informational result. I've seen it happen before where we started getting positive results. And then when we broke the samples up and tested individual parts, we very specifically isolated it to one part. And it ended up being that the coding that they were using on that very specific part was contaminated. And of course, considering alternative steps in your production that target endotoxin, heat treatment if your products can take it, ultrafiltration, things like that. And with that, we are on to the questions and answers. So I think I'm going to give it back to Mike. Thanks, Dan. Uh, appreciate you educating us on all that's going on with BET. Um, we learned some great information today. So we have received some questions. And uh, if you have questions and you haven't submitted them yet, now is the time to do so. So we're going to start off with our first question for you, Dan, is does a specification need to be provided if we are just testing for informational purposes? That's a good question. Um, I do see that a lot. Sometimes it's not so much about the end release of a product, but it's more about finding out um, if a production line is being set up, just getting a baseline, seeing if there is any endotoxin and where it can be coming from. So the answer to that is no. Um, you do not need a specification in that case if you're testing for informational purposes. But when it comes time to test the finished product for release, then yes, you're going to need one. Great. Thanks, Dan. Here's our next question. Which method may I use to test plastic pipettes for endotoxins? You can use either. Um, plastic pipettes should not have anything in them that would interfere with an optical test. Um, so I would suggest the kinetic test and I would suggest it at a very low sensitivity um, or rather a high sensitivity, which is a low number um, because that's really important if you're, especially if you're using these pipettes to run endotoxin testing, you really need to make sure that they're clean and not interfering with the test. So I would suggest kinetic testing with a high sensitivity. Great. Thanks, Dan. Here's our next question. Is there any recommendation for the extraction volume on medical devices, or do you, or do you just adjust the, the volume? There is a recommendation. Uh, there's a recommendation of 40 milliliters per device. It is not a rule. Um, we do adjust it. 40 milliliters is not often enough to, oh, I think that my screen went away. Well, I don't need it. Um, oh boy, I'm so sorry. I'm having te technical difficulties here. All right, I think I'm back. <laughs> um, sorry. You're, you're um, fine, Dan. <laughs> I, I thought I closed everything and then I had a pop-up. What was the question? Um, let me see if I can find that again. You know, Dan, it popped off my screen. Hmm. Sorry about that. Let's just get, uh, let's get our next question in here. Sorry about that. Um, and we, we, we do have a copy of these questions. And if we don't get to all of them, we will be able to respond to you um, after the event. So apologies for that. So our next question is, is the endotoxin test needs to be, does it need to be performed after sterilization? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it should be performed on your finished product. And I'm assuming your finished product would be the sterilized one. Um, so yes. Great. Our next question, Dan, 
Do you recommend the use of gloves to perform testing? If not, what type of study do you recommend as evidence for use of them or not? There have been a lot of studies on this. Um, so within Nelson Labs, um, most of our endotoxin testing is performed without gloves. And the reason for this is that it has been shown that First of all, the sources of endotoxin, such as gram-negative bacteria, mostly E. coli, are typically not found on hands. Um, does not, that's not the sort of contamination you find on somebody's hands. Um, endotoxin is very difficult to transfer dry. It transfers much better wet. And the time that it takes to perform an, endo, an LAL test is so rapid, um, if you're extracting a product it's maybe 20, 30 minutes to process it and it sits for an hour in the liquid and then the test is performed in under an hour. Um, it's not really long enough, even if you did manage to introduce E. coli, it's not really long enough for it to grow. So um, testing can be performed without gloves, assuming the technician is gonna of course wash their hands. Um, I don't know that any major, major research has come out on this, but I know that intern a lot of places have done internal studies to show that it's it's okay to do. Great, thanks, man. Here we have a sampling plan question for you. Mm -hmm. it says, how can I set a sampling plan if a batch has, for example, six thousand samples? If a batch had six thousand samples, um, then the sample size would be ten. If you go by that chart, it's 3% of your sample size up to a maximum of 10. Okay, hey, here's our next question. Is there any acceptable spiking ratio of the sample preparation? One to one or maybe lower? Um, if I understand this question, it's asking, hmm, I'm not sure that I understand that question. I can repeat it one more time and, and maybe yeah, that will help. Is there any acceptable spiking ratio of the sample preparation? I think what they're asking is if it's 1.1 or could it be lower? When spiking samples, um, there's two ways to do it. The first is that you can prepare a solution that has the endotoxin concentration you're interested in spiking with. And the other way is called a hot spike, where usually if you were doing a kinetic test, let's say, and you're preparing your samples in a microplate, you spike endotox directly into the sample. Um, I don't know if that answered the question, but typically the spikes for routine testing for gel clots, you spike to two lambda. And then for the kinetic testing, you spike to approximately the midpoint of your standard curve. Okay, and again, if some of these questions, if, uh, if need follow up, please, you, you can always email uh, Dan. Uh, and he can also follow up addition, with additional information. So here's a, we have a, a few more minutes for a couple more questions. So here's the next one, Dan. Can you explain how is the sensitivity of the lysate calculated? That's determined by the manufacturer. Um, so like I said, the manufacturer has access to reference standard endotoxin and then produces control standard endotoxin. That is highly, highly controlled um, because what that standard is, it's not the same as the endogenous endotoxin you would find in a sample or a culture. It's purified LPS from E. coli. So that standard is very, very similar. Um, what does change is the lysate 
because that's sourced from a biological source, the horseshoe crab. So depending on, you know, all sorts of stuff, the weather that year, this, that, the water temperature, that can be different. So when a manufacturer obtains a batch of uh, lysate, they compare it to the standards that they have and they can adjust it. They, and then they, what they tell the lab is if you reconstitute, if you rehydrate this vial with 2.2 milliliters, your lysate will be sensitive to 0 0.03. The next batch may be 2.4. The next batch may be 2.7. So this is actually, I didn't cover this, but when you're performing endotoxin testing, you can't just grab any two, you can't just grab a CSE and you can't just grab a lysate. They have to actually be paired together um, and then verified in the laboratory. So when the laboratory gets a test or a, a set of standards, They'll read the manufacturer's instructions. Okay, they're saying to reconstitute with 2.5. They'll do that, and then they have to make sure that the test results that they get make sense. Um, so that is that's a good question, but the, ultimately the manufacturer determines it. All right, Dan, thanks. So here's another question: Is the combination device specification needs to be for individual part? or the total device? Total. Um, I've, I've tested a few product kits. Um, yeah, so if you have a kit that has three devices in it, then it has to be between the three of them 20, or whatever your specification you're holding it to. Um, if all of those parts are going to be contacting the patient at the same time, and all potentially releasing endotoxin into the patient at the same time, then you'd have to make sure that that combined endotoxin load is within the specification that is set by the tolerance of humans. Great, and I think we have time for one last question, Dan. So here it is. Do you have any knowledge of loss of endotoxin over time? For example, how much time can I store a sample under refrigeration without compromising endotoxin levels? It depends on how you're storing it. Um, typically, we don't recommend, the recommendation is really no more than six to eight hours. Um, endotoxin is very good at ab absorbing to surfaces, um, more so to plastic than glass. So you can, if you let uh, your standard series sit and then you test it later, you may find a slight loss in endotoxin activity. Um, because the test is so rapid, things don't usually sit around for very long. But yeah, about six to eight hours is the most, the longest you should go. Great. Thanks, Dan. And and thank you everyone for attending today's session on bacterial endotoxin. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but we would like to remind you that you can access all of our previous webinars at nelsonlabs.com under the education tab and the on-demand webinars. You'll be able to access this recording and the previous recordings of the two-day pharmaceutical webinar series in about a week. Uh, we'd like to ask you again, if you have any additional questions for Dan or we weren't able to get your question answered, that you're able to contact him as well. If you have any pricing information or need a quote, you can always contact the Nelson Labs sales department at sales at nelsonlabs.com. Again, today, we'd like to thank you for attending today's session. We, have, we hope that you have a great rest of your day.